Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. to fuck that this week i am joined by two out of the three people of the paranormal peeps podcast josh and jamie thank you so much for coming on today and today we're going to talk about something paranormal or demonic Sudley Town is an abandoned settlement off of dark entry road in cornwall and it's not your typical ghost town Nestled in the heart of Connecticut, this abandoned settlement isn't just deserted, it's almost as if it has been erased, leaving behind a legacy of curses, hauntings, and untold stories that would make even a hardened ghost hunter, like the two that I have on my podcast today, think twice about spending a night there. All right, let's jump in. So how is Dudley Town so well known in in Connecticut? Yeah, so it's an abandoned settlement off of, you know, I don't know why they named it this because I feel like naming the road to Dudley Town, this name just draws more attention to it. But it's a road called Dark Entry Road in a, a very, very appropriate. They don't want to draw attention to it, but they're like, let's give it the most ominous name ever. So it's uh, located in Cornwall, Connecticut. And Honestly, it just has a legacy of being cursed and demonic because everybody that lived there either went insane, moved away, or died. Wow. Yeah, that, that'll do it. And then you call it dark, you know. Dark entry road. <laughs> why don't you call it haunted haunted road highway or haunted highway? Exactly. Well, because it's not a highway, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. It's a pretty small area in Litchfield County, so it's kind of tucked away. But people know where it is. Oh, I bet. Especially over there. Right. Yeah. So the story of Dudley Town began in the early 1740s when the land was settled by Thomas Griffiths. And then shortly after he settled, the Dudley family came into the picture a little bit later with various members of the family moving over time. And they finally all settled in by 1753. But here's where it gets juicy. So the legend has it that the Dudley family was cursed back in England thanks to one ancestor having the audacity to chop the head off of King Henry VIII's advisor. There's a lot of beef between the Dudley family and the royalty. It goes even deeper than this, believe it or not. Most people believe that this curse followed the Dudley family from England, shadowing them across the pond to America. So. Edmund Dudley was actually executed by King Henry VIII in 1509 for stealing tax money from his royal treasury. You were trying to be Robin Hood? No, he was trying to keep it all to himself. This family had ulterior motives, and their motives were to be rich and to run everything. Ah, power hungry. Yes. So after this, Edmund's son, John, the Duke of Northumberland, conspired to overthrow the throne and take control of it. So in order to do this, it involved his son Guilford marrying a woman known as Lady Jane Grey, who was King Henry VII's great-granddaughter. It gets twisted. So King Henry VIII's successor was Edward VI, and in order for the plan to work, John and his second son, Robert Earl of Leicester, and I looked this up because I was like, I know an earl is up there, but I don't know what it is. It's the third highest rank with Duke being the first highest rank in British nobility. So he had to convince King Edward, who was 15 and dying, likely of tuberculosis, to pass the crown on to John's daughter-in-law, Lady Jane, who married Guilford. And they succeeded. Lady Jane took over erroneously after King Edward's death and was proclaimed the queen on July 10th, 1553, four days after he died. But Edward had a half-sister, Lady Mary, who was after, like two weeks after, proclaimed as the true queen by the Privy Council of England. And nine days after Lady Jane was declared queen, Lady Mary took over. And their plan was 
thwarted. And in response to this, everybody was sentenced to death for the conspiracy except for Robert. Wow. Crazy. John was executed in 1553, followed by Lady Jane, and her husband, Guilford, was murdered five months later. They were all beheaded. Man. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're already cursed. They're not, they're not even in the U.S. yet, or their territories yet. <laughs> they're already cursed. Yep. Evidently, Guilford's older brother, who was in France, returned to England and brought the plague with him, which ended up killing thousands of his countrymen. Everybody ended up hating the Dudleys after this. They were like, that's it. We're done. We hate them. And that is where, allegedly, the curse came to fruition. They had the, the worst reputation ever. I think if you were patient zero with the plague and yeah. you're the one that brought it to the country, I'm pretty sure people, everybody would hate you and your family. Yeah. I don't know that he was truly patient zero, but I do know that he did bring it to that area and then killed all of his countrymen. So I, I know it wasn't intentional, but that's... Man, that's just... Not, not a good look. No, no, <laughs> no not a good look. So William, a descendant of Robert, moved to the New World, and it was his great-grandsons that ended up settling in Dudley Town in the 1750s. Nice. Which, for all of those people out there, is still... 23 years prior to the founding of the country because that was 1776. Yes. So life in Dudley Town was not the colonial dream. Most places weren't the colonial dream. <laughs> yeah. This one was exceptionally worse. Oh, boy. So why was it so bad? A lot of scholars and historians say that the area was rocky, the soil was poor, and farming was about as fruitful as trying to get a confession out of a ghost. Oh, that could be, you know, we can actually do that now. So, <laughs> <laughs> but back then, probably a lot harder. Yeah. But in spite of these challenges, the community of Dudley Town still grew and it peaked in the mid 19th century before things started to go downhill. And there are a lot of theories as to what caused the demise. There are people that think that it was due to poor agriculture and things like that. But then other people believe it was the curse that eventually ruined Dudley Town years and years and years later. Do you know what the population was at its peak? I don't, but I can try to find that answer really quickly. Records might be hard to find. According to U.S. Ghost Adventures... It peaked in 1854 at 26 families. It is a really, really small, small area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's probably accurate. Yeah, 26 families count for, so like about 100 people. Yeah, I'd say so. That's, I mean, that's not bad, but if you don't have any way to really feed them because you can't really grow crops, that does make it a challenge. What I think is interesting is this settlement was within Cornwall and Cornwall by all accounts was thriving at the time. So it is interesting to consider that this one small plot of land was completely isolated in terms of how it was doing, which I guess doesn't really make sense while it's doing okay. And this community is within the confines of Cornwall. It's interesting to consider what about this one unique spot is making it so hard to thrive? Yeah, which honestly brings brings back the curse aspect of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if you're like, hey, look, everyone's doing great. Everyone is prosperous and, and thriving. But this tiny little spot right there isn't. It must be cursed. That's what a lot of people believe. The decline of Dudley Town didn't happen overnight, obviously. It was a really slow and agonizing crawl into oblivion. There was a lot of disease. Crops that were once yielding began to fail, and unexplained deaths became the norm. There were accounts of insanity among the residents, which really painted a picture of a community potentially under demonic siege. The first record of this happening was Abiel Dudley, who went insane. 
He had a lot of money and was thriving. He suddenly decided to spend it all and he became the pauper of Dudley Town. He went so insane that he was under the care of a custodian for the remainder of his life. That's just crazy because like you're talking about someone who's like fit of mind and body and then decides to just give everything away, essentially. And not long after, his three brothers died under strange circumstances. I couldn't really find anything that elaborated on that. Uh, did, did they die like close together or? Yeah, it was. It seems like it was pretty much in succession. So after Abiel died, his three brothers died not long after. But I couldn't really find a definitive year or month as to when it happened. But the way that it was phrased, it seemed to happen within a shorter span of time, pretty close together. Now, a man named Nathaniel Carter purchased Abiel's home in 1759, which was obviously a big mistake. The Carter family subsequently relocated to New York after strange occurrences, but whatever was allegedly troubling them in Dudley Town ended up following them to New York. One of Nathaniel's children died of a mysterious illness. To be fair, all of these mysterious illnesses are probably consumption, which was tuberculosis before they knew what tuberculosis was. But what happened to the rest of his family is insane. In 1764, his wife and youngest children were allegedly murdered. They then burned the house down, kidnapping the... Oh, I made a mistake. His youngest child. They then burned the house down and kidnapped the remainder of his children. There were three more. And Nathaniel wasn't home at the time, but on his way home, he was caught heading back to his home and was murdered following the attack on his family. Oh, geez. I don't know what to say about that. That is like the oddest of coincidences if you believe in coincidences because like your son's your your one kid's murdered three kids are kidnapped the house is burned down you're on your way back to the house you have no idea what's going on and then you're murdered on your way home jeez it gets weirder (laughs) it's already (laughs) weird (laughs) nathaniel's brother still lived in dudley town and he suffered a similar fate in 1774 A mysterious illness killed his entire family, but nobody else became ill, just the Carters, which is interesting to think that in such a small community, from an epidemiological standpoint, to consider such a small community, let's say they did get tuberculosis, the fact that nobody else got sick is actually a miracle. That is odd. Yeah, because TB, when it came, it ran through communities like wildfire. Like everybody was getting it. It's insanely contagious to this day. Yeah. So they just so just one family got sick and died of some unknown illness. Just the Carters. And again, I'm skeptical, but I think it's interesting to think that so Nathaniel moved, his whole family after he moved, dead. And then back in Dudley Town, his brother, just the Carters, die of a mysterious illness, but the illness is confined to their home. Just I don't know, spooky. Yeah, it's that is odd. And it's the same home as the other family that died mysteriously. So I kind of wonder if there's something in the house. Well, that was Nathaniel, his brother. Right. The first guy that moved to New York. They didn't like the Carter family, whatever it was. It's like they're tainted. They made some, They made somebody yeah. mad. <laughs> and what's interesting is, so that happened in 1774. I couldn't really find record of anything happening until 1813, which is a long time later. And in 1813, another mysterious illness wiped out a majority of the remaining residents of Dudley Town. Oh, that is... As in, like, everybody? Almost. Almost. That is strange, because you have nothing going on, which that... I don't know. That's not super surprising in a way, like when you're looking at historical records, because, I mean, those are a couple hundred years old and we weren't the best at keeping Mm -hmm. records. (laughs) So, like, that's not surprising that that we can't find anything. But then uh, then another mysterious illness wiping everybody out. That does sound a little more like TB. Yes. But then almost 60 years later in 1872, things get weird again. So Mary Greeley, who was actually the wife of, I thought this was so interesting. I had no idea that this was a thing in Connecticut, but there was a man named Horace Greeley, her husband. He was the founder of the New York Tribune, and he was actually running for president at the time. 
And just a few days before he learned that he had lost the presidential election, she hung herself. Oh, geez. It's crazy. Yep. He eventually went insane and died on November 29th that same year. Well, it just gets better and better, don't it? This is, a, <laughs> this like... is the happiest place on earth. <laughs> it's going to get a lot worse. Oh. oh, man. Things are just starting now to really ramp up. Oh, boy. A man named Gershon Hollister was murdered a couple of years later in another man named William Tanner's home. And everybody believed that Tanner did it because, you know, it happened in his home. But Tanner vehemently denied having anything to do with his murder. And he eventually went insane, maybe because he couldn't live with the guilt, maybe because of something else. And he spoke frequently of demons until he died at 104 years old. So he went insane and lived until he was 104 and cried about demons every day until he died. Oh, man, that's sad. How long did he have to suffer that way? Because that seems like a long time. Yeah, it didn't really say. So he might have spent over half of his life insane talking about demons. Probably. And this is going to be an interesting link between some other people that live in Dudley Town at the time. This is going to be a really common trend. So there was a general's wife who died by lightning strike a couple of years later. And not long after, he developed dementia and died. And around this time, people started speaking of large demonic green entities. Obviously, there were a lot of residents that were going insane. And the families that remained in Dudley Town quickly fled. Rightfully so. I think I would have been out a few deaths prior to this. I think I would have been like, all right, that's my cue to leave. Yeah. And nobody wanted to move in. Well, why would you? Like, <laughs> Well, well. There was one man who did want to move in because the appeal of being the only resident or one of the only residents, that was an appeal that he wanted to chase. So one of the last residents was an Irishman named Patrick Brophy, and he loved the idea of living in solitude, which I understand. I don't think this is the place, but I digress. Yeah. <laughs> Pat Brophy moved his wife and two sons and his flock of sheep to Dudley Town in 1892. Bad idea. His entire flock of sheep died suddenly. And really, from what I could find, it was unclear how or why. His wife then died of tuberculosis consumption. And then his two sons disappeared without a trace. Wow. Not died, disappeared. Just gone. Disappeared. Completely vanished. Jeez. So... He was left alone and he refused to leave. He stated that he wasn't afraid of ghosts. He wasn't afraid of wild animals. And so Dudley Town said, okay, hold my beer. Burned his house down. He was obviously forced out. And a week later, he was seen walking around Cornwall, yelling about giant animals that had cloven hooves and green demonic spirits that chased him out of Dudley Town. That is crazy. Was he the last resident there or were there more? So there's one more family. It's actually a couple. So the official last residents of Dudley Town came and went sometime around 1920. And this is really sad. They're all really sad, but this one for some reason made me super emotional. So while exploring Connecticut, William Clark, who was a physician in New York and his wife came across it, they unfortunately thought that it was quaint, isolated, and romantic, and they wanted to build a small cottage there that they could vacation in when he wasn't working as a physician in the city. So they bought land and they built their home in Dudley Town. And everything was okay for four years until 1924 while they were vacationing during the summer at the cottage. Dr. Clark was unexpectedly called to the city for an emergency and he had to leave his wife and she had accompanied him to the train station. And from what I gathered, she was acting very off. She was very quiet and distant, but she couldn't really articulate why. And he noted that that was strange, but there wasn't anything like actually wrong with her. She just seemed kind of out of sorts. And he was gone for less than 36 hours. And when he returned, his wife wasn't at the station, which was normal. And so he thought that that was strange. 
And so he got a ride back through Dudley Town and noticed that the door to his cottage was not only unlocked, but it was slightly ajar and it was completely pitch black inside. And when he recounted what happened, he said that he heard a sound that stuck with him for the rest of his life. And it was a sound that you would only hear in an insane asylum. He heard a hysterical, high-pitched laugh that he recognized as his wife. And when he found her, she had gone completely insane. Until the day she died, she too talked about demons and animal-like spirits that chased her. Man, that is something else. Couldn't imagine coming home to you're finding gone, your loved one. You're gone for a day and a half. Yeah. And that they've quick. gone, they've basically gone insane. Yeah. That's really sad. So what remains there today? When Dr. Clark left Dudley Town, that was the end of life for the cursed land. Fast forwarding to the 20th century, Dudley Town transformed from a struggling settlement to nightmare fuel. There were reports of ghost sightings, unexplained lights, and eerie sounds that flickered through the dense forest. And a lot of people that went to the area, especially from what I saw in the 1970s, would come back with weird stories of experiences that were not explainable. But today, Dudley Town is private property. And let me tell you, the Dark Entry Forest Association, which is just a great name, they don't play. They are very serious about keeping thrill seekers and ghost hunters out to protect the land, maybe, to protect people from the land. Maybe a little bit of both. It's up, it's up for debate. Well, <laughs> it's interesting because Dr. Dr. Clark was one of the founding members of the Dark Forest Associ- Dark Entry Forest Association. So you got to wonder if they're just trying to keep rights to it or if they're just trying to, I don't know, almost protect one of their own, even almost a you know eighty years now after the fact, it is so heavily protected. The likelihood of you getting arrested by state police is so high. It's completely gated off at one point. I don't know if they still do, but when I went, they had, and for years after and prior, which I knew before going in, they had private security that would watch the area. And the locals that live in the area will also call and report any cars that are parked on the streets. So it's very heavily protected. Makes you wonder what they're protecting. Right. Well, I was I was thinking, like, is some of it environmental? Like back then, you wouldn't know if there were some um, environmental things that had an effect on people and animals alike could True. some of it been environmental it's very possible but it wouldn't explain all of it no it could it I mean you can explain the unexplained deaths it could explain the insanity and the hallucinations yes. associated yes. to it but it doesn't explain a building randomly burning down were there any like I, th- I thought I read somewhere where they had like some mills there at a certain point. I wonder if it was anything like from the mills being there and stuff like for mining. To my knowledge, there isn't any mining in that area. I did try to see if there was anything environmental that went on and there's no record of anything that would cause anything of the sort in that in that land. Man, that's it's yeah, that was the first thing I was thinking about too. It's something environmental associated to it. Right. Especially like gold mining. Uh the process in which you get gold out of ore is very toxic and very dangerous. But if there's no gold mining in Connecticut, which I don't know. I don't No. Yeah, that area is super woodsy. It's a very quiet area still to this day. There's really nothing in terms of factories or anything like that in that area. 
And from what I understand, it was just a town where people had lived. There was really nothing else established in that area. I'm not sure about Cornwall. Historians, especially historians from Connecticut, the only explanation that they give is that it, just disease, isolation, and hardships of pioneer life. Well, okay. So if you're talking 1750s, 18, early 1800s, right? I would agree with you. I think that very, seems very common, right? But once you get into the 1920s and you're talking about a doctor of medicine and his wife, you're talking about 36 hours. Like that's a different level of, of peace to it. You're talking about someone who obviously understands the, the medical field and probably could diagnose his wife with something else going on. So it's, yeah, that, that part seems probably a little less likely. Now, isolation, I get. People do go insane uh, from isolation, but that's a slow process. It's not like, it's not like you get put in a room by yourself and, and the next day you're, you're seeing little green men, or actually in this case, big green men or things walking around. Yeah, and they lived in the city in the 1920s, which was a bustling place. And that's what I think is the most interesting about Dudley Town is the tragedies that happened there can't be explained by either coincidence or natural causes. So what's the explanation? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> that's that's a very good question. Okay, so let's talk about hauntings. I mean, you obviously found your way onto the property. <laughs> yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I went there. It's a long hike. And really all it is, is it just looks like a bunch of old foundations. And I personally did not have any strange experiences there. But I will say that it was really, really quiet, like more quiet than the rest of the hike there, which is something that everybody says. And I don't really know what the explanation to that is, maybe because it is an area that is slightly more clear than the rest, but that was really all that I experienced there. But my uncle did go and he had a very different story. And my uncle is not a guy that gets scared easily in any capacity. And he told me about this when I was a kid and I had chatted with him the other day and I was like, were you the one that told me this story? And he confirmed it and retold it to me. And I remember him telling me this when I was like 10 and it stuck with me. He went with his friends and they had like, they made these makeshift torches. I think he said they use like baby oil on sticks with, I don't know, cloth or paper towels. And they go and the woods is loud. You can hear like crickets, animals, wind, what have you. When they got to the area where the old settlement used to be with the foundations and stuff, he said that it got quiet. Their torches wouldn't stay lit. And they felt really creeped out by it. And they were like, all right, we're going to leave. And as they started to leave, they were hearing things ricocheting off of the trees, almost like somebody was throwing like rocks at the trees and they were kind of ricocheting off and they left quickly. I would. Yep. <laughs> that yeah. <point. laughs> uh, yeah, I would too. See, that's what I found in the research of what I was trying to find. People were saying that the town is to the point of quiet of like a recording studio. Like when you go to the recording studio, you know, like there's no echo, there's no reverberation. It's just dead. Nothing. Yeah, it's just nothing. That doesn't make any sense. Like acoustically, it makes no sense. Like if you're walking for five miles in the in the forest and you're hearing crickets and birds and animals rustling and stuff like that, and you get to another spot that's just like that, you still should hear insects and wind and birds. animals yeah. and birds. It shouldn't go dead quiet and things shouldn't stop echoing all of a sudden. It's super quiet. That's the one thing that I notice. I have one of those brains where I have to attribute things to something. Everything has to have an explanation. So I was like, ah, it's probably just, maybe there's not as many trees in this area. We're not hearing the wind rustling through the leaves and stuff, but it is interesting that everybody has that same exact experience. Yeah, that's that in itself is weird. Has anybody seen the green entities or the green spirits in in Dudley Town, the ones that have dared to go and talk about it. 
I couldn't find anything about that, but I did find one really weird story on the Damned Connecticut website that gave me chills because I don't know how or why somebody would come across what they came across, but I can I can read it to you. So the story goes, I went camping there several times in the 70s, and I will say that we did not sleep. I will agree with the poster above and state the absolute silence and the absence of any creatures that usually live in the area was a little unnerving. When we used to camp, I was 18, and all I heard was that the place was supposed to be haunted. When I read a book that chronicled the history of Dudley Town, I only went back a few times during the day because I wouldn't go there at night anymore. One of the times I went back during, I found a dead horse in one of the foundations. It was covered with branches. It hadn't even decomposed yet. Somebody dumped a dead horse down in the foundation less than 48 hours prior. That's weird. That is odd. It doesn't like, make why? any sense. Yeah. It's not like the horse just died there because somebody covered it with branches and leaves. Right. And if you were out there like horseback riding, you wouldn't just leave no. your horse there. Oh my. That's odd. Yeah, it was really creepy. But there are dozens of stories on Reddit and on Damned CT where people say the same thing, that they felt really uneasy and that it was insanely quiet. Wow. That would be an odd feeling, I think. Yeah. The absence of just the normal sounds of a wooded area. Right. Well, normally, if you're in the woods and the woods go quiet, that generally means there's a, a predator. There's a predator around. But so, it's like that all the time. Right. Which means... So there's an on-scene predator. Oh, that's even scarier, actually. Well, I mean, think about it, though. With all these happenings and the reports of seeing these entities and, you know, back in the day. And wouldn't that be considered like an on-scene predator, mostly? Yeah, I think so. And there's always the quiet? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would make sense to me, but that's just me. It made me think of Appalachian TikTok, which I've recently discovered and wish I never did because now all of my recommended videos are terrifying. <laughs> and there was this one video of this guy who was riding, I think, a dirt bike through the trails. And I guess there are a couple of rules. You have to get in before dark. If you hear somebody say your name, no, you didn't. You got to close your blinds and just not be out at night. Why that is, I don't want to know. I'd rather just not know and <laughs> remember those rules. But there was this video of this guy who was riding through and it didn't look like the video was cut or edited in any way. Maybe it was. And he's riding and you can hear the woods and he's like, all right, it's starting to get dark. I got to ride back. And all of a sudden like that, it gets dead quiet and you can hear his breathing start to accelerate and he's like and he starts flying he's like i gotta get out of here this is really bizarre and so it made me think of that video for some reason where the woods just fell completely silent yeah that That'd is be weird. scary <laughs> no thanks <laughs> that is weird i wish people were allowed to visit i get why they're not yes well they they've had trespassers they've had vandalism there and there's not much left from what i understand it's the vandalism part that bothers me the most. It, yeah. Yeah. I just don't like the, like, it's one thing to visit a spot. It's another one to destroy it and deface it. And it's like, you know, like this is someone's house or was mm -hmm. someone's house, right? Like you don't need to go there and spray paint or bust it with rocks or anything like that. And I mean, you see it in any of the abandoned places that you can visit, like someone goes in there and just destroys it. You know, we did that. Uh, we were up at an old cemetery. It's called Merker Cemetery. It was an old ghost town uh, that doesn't exist anymore. It was destroyed th four times, unfortunately. Um, but there, the cemetery still remains. And there are wood fences around these grave sites on, on a, a few of them. And we went up there one week and checked it out. And the very next week we went up, people had gone up there and kicked in and busted these fences. Yeah. For no other reason than just to vandalize things. Yep. Yeah. There's this cemetery in Connecticut called Union Cemetery that I also went to. And you could go back in 2008. And now they also have security apparently and it's gated off and you can't go probably because people, I mean, it's an old cemetery. There are gravestones that are hundreds of years old. So I'm sure people went and 
defaced it. And so now you can't go there either. It's so sad because when people do that, then they stop allowing anybody to come in. Yeah. You know, and they ruin it for everybody, honestly. If I was a ghost, I would make it my afterlife's mission to haunt that person forever, forever. I would just haunt them and scare them. Jump scares every day. (laughs) Right. I agree. That's the thing, though, like this, this, even just like this Dudley Town party, like trying to figure out what happened there and why so much strangeness has happened on that property, allowing people to go and investigate, whether it's geologically, scientifically, or just paranormally, those things can be important to help cement the history of what's going on, but not allowing true investigative people to go out there does unfortunately make it a hard, uh, hard thing to figure out when it actually happened. Yeah. You have to wonder, I mean, with, with so many, I can see why they call it a curse Oh, I definitely. Mean, because this just, it transpires over all these years and for such a small area to have such a great amount of these incidents, like it is, it's unexplainable. Like you can't even, I can't even begin to wrap my mind around what it could be environmental. Yeah. Maybe some of it, but I, that can't account for all of it. No, there's more to it. The illness makes sense to me, right? Because tuberculosis or even any, I mean, it could even be something as simple as a bacterial infection because this was before penicillin. But the people that were by all accounts mentally stable, just suddenly and inexplicably going insane and saying that they're seeing the same things, that's what creeps me out. Now, again, maybe it could have been something environmental that was doing something to their brains, thus causing them to have this cognitive decline. But what would cause them to see the same thing? And again, by all accounts, there's nothing that could be explained environmentally. So it's just creepy. Well, and that's what makes me think of water. Like, is there something in the water that was causing this issue? Because I imagine the 26 homes that were there weren't on a single communal well. They might have had, you know, multiple wells. And there are things in the water that can cause issues, you know, bacteria and uh, parasites that can cause insanity in those pieces, which could theoretically actually operate very quickly some of those brain eating uh, amoebas can kill you within you know 24 hours that's crazy too but but how well, does like she said how does it explain her seeing you know them seeing the same things like these green creatures yeah and from what i read one of the biggest explanations is that it was far from a water source. I read some people like on blogging sites saying that they used Cornwall as a water source, whether that's true or not. I'm not sure, but I do know that the, whatever water source they were using wasn't in Dudley Town. Okay. So how did they get water? I'm assuming they got it from Cornwall, which would make sense because it looked like they didn't, they weren't close to a, a potable water source, which would be weirder. The fact that you built a town away from water makes zero sense. It's, it, it, of, of two things that you need to have a town, right? You need water and you need food. <laughs> like food can be brought in. Well, obviously so could water. Yeah, Cornwall's really close. How close are we talking? Dudley Town is a settlement literally in Cornwall. But it said nothing about the people. If they were getting their water from Cornwall, it said nothing about the people in Cornwall having these types of issues. Cornwall still exists to this day, and I haven't heard anything weird about Cornwall. So it's like you could kind of rule the water out, I think. (sighs) Well, you can unless there's one other really crazy possibility. What? You have somebody in Cornwall who's supplying water to these people who wants them dead. And who's purposely (laughs) who's purposely tainting water when they want to, 
which would explain for a lot of, which could potentially explain for a lot of these old ones. But again, that starts going away when you look at the fact that the last one was 1924. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it transcends through many, many, many years. Yeah, yeah we're talking 1753 to 1924. Yeah. It's 170 years of history. You can't explain away all of it. Or even, yeah, there's no way to, to rationalize all of it. Especially when in 1924, the symptoms associated to his wife, insanity, green demons, and those things are the same things that happened in, in 53. What I think is interesting is that Dark Entry Forest Association sent to Connecticut state legislators support of a constitution amendment. And part of it reads, if the state were to ever sell, swap, or in some manner repurpose Wyantanoc State Forest, Dark Entry Forest Inc. and its members will certainly appreciate the opportunity to offer testimony at a public hearing or as written comments as to how such a contraindicated transaction would negatively impact both human and ecological health. We look forward to voting favorably for the constitutional amendment when it reaches the ballot box during 2018. What? Interesting. That that says they know something. That's like if you're saying, hey, we're going to come to Congress and we're going to tell you why you shouldn't do this. Because it's bad for the environment and it's bad for the health of people. This says you know something. I tried to Google it. I can't even find a single member of Dark Entry Forest Incorporated. They are completely anonymous. Wow. But they were established December 9th of 1924. Obviously, shortly after Dr. Clark found his wife in a almost catatonic state yeah and their well their first meeting was actually officially 1926 and there were 41 members but what yeah there's more there than what they're gonna tell there's but. yeah there's something there that's that's hidden or they believe something is there right either they know or they have this really strong belief that there's a problem and the fact that they're willing to put money aside to make sure people get arrested for trespassing that tells you that they they really are concerned about something either there or getting out like information i mean at this point we can only speculate yeah so strange yeah yeah that is so odd but the thing is is you know you can't get in there you can't do a proper investigation you can't go in there and like test the soil or anything um, in the area. So we will probably never have any inkling as to what is really going on there. Yeah. And there is a local radio host for I-95, which is a classic rock station in Connecticut. And one of the hosts, their names are Ethan and Lou. And Lou did a FOIA request and was trying to figure out all this information. And I haven't looked into it recently. This was like 2018, 2019. And they were just blocking them left and right. (laughs) So it's just interesting. I don't know if anything ever came about it. I should Google it. But I'm assuming that he probably never got anything out of it. Yeah. Yeah. All roads lead to a dead end when it comes to that, it sounds like. So I found an update on that FOIA request and they did give him access to documents. But in the article, he said that it was in 2021, essentially almost entirely redacted and thus completely useless. There was no information in any of the documents. So it's really, really, really strange. Yeah. So, I mean, it's obvious they are working so hard to keep it under wraps. Yes. Yeah. And in my brain, thinking from a science perspective, okay, let's say that there is something, maybe it's the soil, some kind of environmental issue. Why wouldn't you just publicly make that statement so everybody shuts up? If it's the soil, you can say, hey, we have this soil test. Here's the data so everybody can stop asking. It's just just weird to me. It's almost like they're perpetuating this spooky, cursed settlement theory by being intentionally vague a hundred years later exactly well and and that's where things like seem strange because like we have utah is a very interesting state because we have a lot of protected lands but we also have a lot of fallout and things from nuclear testing but we also have some very valuable minerals in the ground 
And some of them are worth like five times that of gold. And so maybe the reason why they are protective of this land is because there are things in the ground, rare earth metals, that would be excruciatingly valuable. And if you release a soil sample report, people are going to be like, you have something in the ground that's very valuable, and now we're going to come and get it. Maybe. Hard to say. It, it's very hard to say. I mean, like I said, they, they just leave us to speculate on all of it because they're keeping it watertight. Yes. And they're not allowing people to debunk and take away any of the reasonable explanations of things. It's probably the fountain of youth or something weird. You have to you have to sacrifice like 100 people and you get to live forever. And then, you know, you've got all these politicians involved. They probably do like a sacrifice. That's probably why the dead horse was there. Sacrificial horse. There you go. <laughs> that's exactly why the dead horse was there. An offering. Yes. You know, yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's how they stay in power is they have to make a sacrifice to the demons that are on the property so they stay in power. Oh, boy. <laughs> Josh and Jamie, thank you both so much for coming on to the show. Definitely check out their podcast. You can find them by searching Paranormal Peeps wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also find them on Twitter at CPR Paranormal Peeps. So is Dudley Town a cautionary tale of the harsh realities faced by early settlers or... Is it proof that some places are just born bad and cursed from the start? I'll leave that for you to decide. But one thing is for sure, Dudley Town remains one of the most intriguing unsolved mysteries of New England, and that mystery will probably never be solved. If you want more of me and my pod, F that pod on Patreon for every single episode. I archive a lot of my old episodes so you get every single episode there. I release them early and ad free, zero ads. If you also liked what you heard, please like, review, subscribe. You can find me on all social media at F that pod except for Instagram, F that underscore pod. I'm on YouTube, F that pod, and the website is F that pod.com. Love you. Bye.